Hey, this week on the show, we've got a retrospective about what's happened in 2023, a forward spective about what's coming in 2024, and then a bit of news, mainly about Fedora, Asahi, and uh, some other stuff that you don't want to miss. So stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is the Untitled Linux Show, episode 132, recorded Saturday, December 30th. A big bucket of binaries. This show is brought to you by members like you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Welcome. It is Saturday, and you know what that means. It's time for the Untitled Linux Show. Welcome, welcome. It is not just me, of course. We have the full cadre, all four of us. Uh, We've got Jeff, we've got Ken, we've got Rob. Welcome to each of you. Glad that you could be here. Glad I could be Great here to, be to here. see the year, year out with y'all. Yeah. Happy New so Year. Our, our show is going to be a little bit of news and then some year in review. We're going to talk about the predictions we made last year about this time and then uh, look forward to 2024 and have some pretty interesting predictions, I think, for going forwards. Um, as we get started, one thing I do want to mention to everyone, one of the big changes this year is uh, don't forget Floss Weekly is now a Hackaday production. So it's going to be part of my uh, my normal plug at the end of the podcast. Um, but I want to go ahead and make sure and mention it now if anyone is not aware. And uh, you can get there. It's hackaday.com slash floss. So go and check that out. Got to pump up those numbers. Um, but let's get on to the news. And. <laughs> Rob, you've got uh, you've got some 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 Mac news instead of some Microsoft news. You just talk about the underdogs in the open source world. Take it away, sir. Yeah, I like to give them a little love. I mean, a lot of people say online all the time, Mac is Linux, right? No, it's not. But um, I'm going to jump the gut a little bit on predictions. I know we're not going to do that till later in the show, but I have to do this because it, it kind of ties in. So my first prediction last year. For 2023, was that Asahi Linux would essentially be fully functional and ready for prime time by November of this year? So the true answer, whether or not I succeeded with that prediction, it, it's an opinion. You know, we, we all can vary on that. But in my opinion, I think I was close. Uh, this summer, Asahi announced a partnership with Fedora Asahi as uh, the flagship Asahi distribution. So Fedora Asahi being their flagship was announced and the announcement was made in august with a plan to release by the end of august well it took a little longer than was planned but last week fedora asai 39 was officially officially released and as the name suggests it is based on and up to date with the the recently released fedora 30 fedora 39 this release comes with KDE Plasma on Wayland with seamless high DPI support out of the box and the ability to support new technologies such as HDR, display notches, because we all love those, and proper display calibration as, as the development progresses on that. But being Wayland, it can be ready for that stuff. Um, it's supported on, I got the big list of, all the the MacBook Air M1, M2, MacBook Pro, a whole bunch of stuff. I, I decided it's going to be too long to list out, but it, it supports a ton of them. You can you can look at the the show notes to find the article for the full list if you really want to know. But it, they go on to say that uh, more Mac Pro devices will be supported as well in future releases. So and then and then coming up in the next several months when we're expecting Fedora 40 to be released. Uh, we could also expect that Fedora Asahi 40 will be released. In that, we're expected to see KDE 6.0, and with it, promises of OpenGL 4.x and Vulkan support to unlock the full potential of Apple Silicon Graphics. So Asahi wasn't ready by November. Maybe if Fedora would have released a little sooner, it could have been. Maybe it was ready, we just didn't have it yet. But I'd say it is now ready by the end of December. And one month off, that's pretty good for predictions, don't you think? 
It's it's not bad. When we now when we talk about yeah. Fedora Asahi, there is there's a feature that we need to mention because this is important to some people and it's not worked in Asahi for the longest time. Uh the Fedora release has audio by default. And the reason that's a big deal is because when when they made the Mac the notebooks with the M1 and the M2, they uh <laughs> they put too powerful of a, an amplifier in there and if you just naively turned it on and turned the volume up to full, you could damage your speakers. And so the Asahi folks made the decision early on that, well, we're going to disable audio until we can actually fix that. Um, and it, boy, as far as I know, the Fedora remix here is the first one that actually has audio on and working by default. Uh, so that's actually a, a pretty a pretty big deal. Um, so and again, goes to your prediction that this is about when it would be ready for prime time. Yeah, so. Uh... Time to uh to get your uh Mac on yet? Well, so I've got I've got a buddy here in town that's got an M1 and talked him into running Linux on it. And I think he I think he is on the the Asahi uh not Fedora, but the the other one. Was it Ubuntu based, maybe? No, it's Arch. I don't know that he the put I don't know that he put the original Arch. The original Asahi it. is Arch based. Yeah, I don't think he put Arch on. I think he has uh, an Ubuntu spin that's Asahi based. Um so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to text him. And let him know that Fedora, the, the Golden Land, is ready for him. <laughs> and that's using Wayland by default, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, on 39 it will be. On 40 it'll be the only option. And uh, yeah, all, all, all kinds of fun stuff coming there. Like breaking stuff? Well, so, about that. <laughs> about that. <laughs> uh, there is, there has been for the longest time, this uh, the, the, the fairly well-known developer has maintained a rant called Wayland Breaks Everything. And it it has been accurate in some cases, um, maybe a little tongue in cheek, because really what it's getting at was for the longest time, Wayland, Wayland was not really ready for prime time. Um, while you could run it, there were just there's always been things that don't don't quite work. So this past week, uh, we got a rather controversial post uh, from from Nate over at Pointed Stick, and uh, he asked the question: Does Wayland <coughs> does Wayland really break everything? And uh, he said the opinion that now the answer is no, it does not. Pretty much everything works. Pretty much. Pretty much almost everything works in Wayland. There's still a couple of little things. But then he makes the point that it's not that Wayland breaks everything. It's that Wayland is different and not everything has been ported to it yet. So Wayland has all of the parts in place to be able to make everything work. And in fact, there are things that work now in Wayland that never, ever worked in X11. Um, and and. It's interesting. Nate talks about this new <coughs> <coughs> this new platform that developers should really be targeting for Linux. Um, and it's it's portals, which that is how you do things like capturing keyboard input for global shortcuts. Use portals, uh, Pipewire and Wayland. And so he calls he calls it PW squared for portals, Wayland, Pipewire. Maybe write it down or go read it, and that'll make more sense. PW squared. Um, it's a really interesting idea that we've kind of turned the corner from Linux, where we're no longer, you know, it's no longer either also Pulse Audio, and and we're not doing everything with X11. Um, and then one of the one of the really interesting things this came out with my conversation on Floss with uh, uh, with Neil Neil Gampa. You're now you see businesses in some cases, even writing proprietary software that only supports Wayland. So PreSonus put out their digital audio workstation. They ported it to Linux, which very cool to see, by the way. Um, they ported it to Linux and it is, you have to be running Wayland. You have to have um, uh, native uh, Vulkan support. And that's the only way, if you do not do that, if, sorry, it won't run. That's the only way it runs. And I thought that was, <coughs> I thought that was really fascinating that that's a, that's the decision that they decided to make is to just really double down on that. And so it, it's 
does Wayland break everything? Well, I mean, if you want to use X11, I suppose. But really, you, you, I think it's more accurate to just see it as it's the direction everything's going. And it's where we're at. Well, I think it makes a lot of sense because that's what's coming. And if I was going to port something right now or build something right now, I think I'd just plan on Wayland and Vulcan and that way I don't have to have some big rewrite or something here in, you know, a year. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, I read that blog post this week and I thought that was really interesting of him. Uh, and, and I thought spot on too, with a lot of the things I like to say yeah. about it. And it's, it's not, you know, like he, he said on there, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, it breaks things because this program doesn't work and this program doesn't work. And kind of what he said on there is that, the program doesn't work because you changed, you know, the, the, the app needs to be ported to Wayland. Yeah. You know, you're trying to use something that's not for it. And, you know, I actually use this argument this week when I was uh, talking about Wayland is, uh, you know, if you go from windows to Linux, you don't blame window or Linux that your apps don't work. You blame the app that they're not ported to Linux. Yeah. So, I mean, it's. Yeah, it's fair. It's so, a fair point. Um, and so, Wayland was never meant to be a, a direct drop-in exact replacement of X11. Yep, that's another point he makes. It was not written as a drop-in. We wouldn't want it to have drop-in as an exact replacement with the same flaws. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really what it boils down no, to. I, 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 I had an, uh, a disagreement with somebody this week who tried to say that it was back in 2008 supposed to be that they that they flaunted it as a direct drop in for it. And honestly, I, I don't remember, I don't remember that. Wayland back then, but what's yeah. that? I don't either. Yeah. I don't yeah no, I, I don't remember that either, but I mean, I didn't really pay much attention to Wayland then either, but all right, we're, we'll get back to Wayland. Don't worry. It'll just going to be like half of the show today, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to let Jeff talk about system D boot and full disk encryption. Jeff, take it away, sir. So a few weeks ago, we talked about how some distributions were talking about booting without Grub for more secure OS. Well, this is now happening. So Open, OpenSUSE, Tumbleweed, and MicroOS are now delivering an image that system, systemd-boot, it's using that as the bootloader, and full disk encryption based on this, on, also on systemd. Now, systemd boot is just like it sounds. It's an UEFI boot manager that automatically detects bootable images, including operating systems and other bootloaders, and provides a basic menu-based interface. So it operates on the EFI system partition, ESP, only, and requires configuration file fragments, kernels, ITRSD, and... I should say, only requires configuration file fragments, kernels, INTR, DS, and other EFI images to reside on that EFI system partition. So you don't need everything. You just need some bits to kind of get it going. So kind of a little, little history of Grub here is Grub is actually, or as we know it, is Grub2. And why is there a desire to bypass Grub? Well, complexity, because the more complex something is, the more there's possible security dangers. So currently, Grub has support for multiple types of file systems, including things like BTRFS and NTFS. It contains a full network stack, a USB stack, a terminal, and it can be scripted. So some people have kind of even said that Grub has said to be almost a mini operating system in and of itself just because of all the different things that's got in there. So now keep in mind the original or now what we, they call legacy grub. So that would be, that would be grub number one started in 1995 and it later went through changes and a rewrite and came out as grub two around 2002, which is what we have today. So now from back then until now things have changed and there's been a lot of work done to have a more focused boot code that works with UEFI. Uh, firmware now supports networking and USB almost always. So this is like, would be like your motherboards. They have that built in now, you know, um, 
I always, I say almost always, cause I got to leave room for those corner case items that somebody else is going to go, well, <laughs> here's this one board, but in general, it's already supported. So because of how common UEFI is and how the motherboard firmware supports so many things more or more things that it used to system D boot cuts out all the redundant code. So it just lets the hardware take care of it and it just assumes UEFI. So now we also have uh, FDE or full disk encryption, which works fine in grub too. And I'm saying just so I'm, perfectly clear i'm not talking about the original but it only works in grub too so if we're going to boot off of system d then we need to encrypt another way you can't you can't use the grub encryption so this one i'm not going to get into the full details but it's it's a more secure encryption because it doesn't need to unlock as many things to boot mm -hmm. If you want full details and really get into the process, how it is more secure, I say suggest going through the article in the show notes as they have a very lengthy description and talking about the process. I mean, they talk about how you can use the TPM2 modules. You can use your own key in addition to the TPM modules. They really get into the weeds. So rather than have this turning to a 30-minute uh, segment, I'm just going to say if you, if you care, go check out the article. I do want to say because of, you know, different architectures and legacy support, I think it's going to be a few years before we really see Grub, you know, start to fade away. But I think we are going to see more and more distributions going to the system D boot coming in the future, it, kind of along the same lines of, you know, getting rid of, you know, some of uh, uh, distributions, get rid of 32 bit and other things like that. Some legacy stuff. I think that's where Grub is going to just kind of start fading away into the background but any any thoughts on that gentlemen i have thoughts so i have never been part of the system d haters club i, I know that there are some that just hate its very existence there are parts of system d that i do not care for at all uh one of them is system d resolve stay away from my dns please you do not fix anything you just make everything worse um i am i am not sure which category system D boot is going to fall into grub two pretty much works pretty well. Now there are times when it is problematic and full disk encryption is one of the times that it leaves a little bit to be desired. So that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I, I, mm, it's going to be quite a while before I'm really uh, excited about system D boot. I think it's got to prove itself first. Oh, yeah. and, and this is the very D first, Go ahead, How will Ken. system D boot affect dual or multi boot options? I assume it's it got shouldn't. support for it. Yeah, it, it shouldn't. It's still got a menu in there, but you're going to have to have a UEFI system. It won't, it's not going to boot on a legacy type, yeah, so, uh, like older hardware. So the idea is really going to be that you have, you have an, a, a UEFI entry for each of your, uh, each of your boot options. So if you want to boot into, say, Windows, it's going to be, you know, you boot up your computer and you hit F9 or whatever, and it's going to give you your boot options and it'll list your UAFI bootloaders. You'll have the Windows bootloader and you'll have System D boot. I would, I, I'm, you know, I haven't used it yet, but that is, the, that is the way I can imagine that working. That's about the only way I can imagine that working. Well, reading the article, it sounded like it would, it would boot into System D. And then if you said wanted Windows, you'd be able to select it and then it could launch mm. that process and just, it, it would, it would then dump itself over to, or, uh, the execution over to Windows. So it might be able to do it both ways. It's what it was re reading like in the article that it, it could handle multiple operating systems. I mean, that makes sense if, and, if system D boot is aware of the other UEFI images in your, your boot partition. Then yeah, it should be able to launch yeah. any of them. Kind of a chain and, loader. And it's where it's it, so yeah, it said it could handle bootloaders as well. So it would just point to then the like the Windows or whatever operating system bootloader so it could yeah. kick off. Yeah. Cool. Well, so it sounds nice. like a, a opportunity for a faster boot, especially if all you have is Linux on there. Yeah. And I guess conversely, you know, 
people that don't like system D, may, maybe there's a grub three coming down the pipe that's, you know, they say, okay, here's the minimum stuff you have to have. And it's not going to, you know, it's going to kind of s- simulate system D and just say, we're not, we're getting rid of the network stack and then the USB stack and all that stuff and trying to uh, simplify things. I, I don't know. Right. I could see it. Ken, I heard you were trying to jump in, make your point, and then tell us about Chimera OS. I'll let you, uh, handle, actually, I'll let you handle your own transition. <laughs> actually, uh, what I was going to put in there is it sounds like this is going to p- be pushing for people to start running more virtual machines f- to support for running those legacy systems on. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Which I wouldn't fun. consider Qu- Chimera to be. No, probably not. In fact, uh, I'm getting this information from Rams Reedes, or excuse me, Remus Reed. He tells us why he thinks we should use Chimera OS. Rob, you ready for this? To turn a PC into a Steam Deck <laughs> instead of running Steam OS. <laughs> Rams starts states Chimera is a console-oriented OS with a dedicated desktop environment. Chimera also serves as a web application on your local network, allowing you to install any game from any device inside your network, as well as manage the entire system. Be warned, especially you, Rob, (laughs) Chimera only works on UEFI-compatible motherboards. So that's going to be an issue there anyways, for those, those of us that would like to occasionally get into a legacy system some of the motherboards may not even support them it can't be installed on any of the older legacy systems so i definitely can't download it on my uh, old lenovo desktop Mm -hmm. since chimera's interface is designed around the steam deck console you will want a game controller plugged into one of your machine's usb ports to get access to every menu in the system now by default you log into the game mode but you can switch to the built-in GNOME desktop using instructions in Ramsey's article. Rob, sound like something you might want to try as an alternative to Arch? Uh, maybe I'll give it a shot, but I wouldn't expect it to become my uh, daily driver. No, not for a desktop. It could be good for a, like a <laughs> HTPC, home theater PC sort of situation. Um, yeah, I could see that. It's cool that it's push- got... It's got support for Steam and RetroArch built into it. That's that's a neat idea. Uh, most distros, though, you can actually boot uh, into SteamOS, into GameScope. Uh, most of them will have a package for GameScope as a compositor. And so then you can log out of KDE or GNOME or whatever you use, and then it'll be an option to log into to go straight into GameScope. Um, and so that's another way to go about this. But uh, yeah, Chimera looks like a... Looks like it'd be worth giving a shot. Now, what would be fun, <laughs> kind of trolly, but fun, is to take Chimera OS and load it directly on your Steam Deck. <laughs> Just because. That's what I was going to ask. Now, I might Anybody? try that. <laughs> <laughs> Scratch that distro hopping jump with your Steam Deck. <laughs> oh, goodness. <clears throat> that, All right. that might be a little beefy for the Steam Deck, though. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be... It's going to be running a lot of the same software and code that uh, Steam OS does. Um, I mean, the Steam Deck has to play games. I mean, modern games, so it's going to be able to run it. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking that it might not fit. You, oh, you better size. have the uh, yeah. Ah. You better have uh, a beefy one. memory stick in there. Uh, I think it'd fit on there fine, but it might uh, really shrink the amount of uh, games I could po- put on there. Unless I use the RetroArch uh, mod- uh, modification. or you put a or... lot of games on there with RetroArch. You put a lot of Super Nintendo games on, <laughs> on that. <laughs> All right. Or end up getting an external drive. Get, uh, uh, walk around with your Steam Deck and an external <laughs> drive. <laughs> 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 Duct tape it to the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh... Let's say, say, save us from this, Rob. Let's talk about Fedora. We got, Let's talk about we got about three Fedora, stories yeah. in a row about Fedora. Rob's going to kick it off, and then I will pick it up. Uh, Rob, what's the first one in uh, probably Fedora forty? This is probably a Fedora forty story, isn't it? This is a Fedora forty story, and I mean it's not necessarily one of 
that excited about, but uh, be interested to have some discussion on this. So, and this next story has nothing to do with my predictions this time, but you know, like uh, it, it seems like it'd be something interesting to discuss. So, Fedora is always pushing the limits and being the first in Linux. And uh, the next idea they are pushing isn't isn't it's not a new technology, but it's new to Linux as far as I'm aware of, uh, at least by default. Maybe I, I I think what I read is apparently you can do this. But uh, in Fedora 40, they are proposing enabling Wi-Fi MAC address randomization by default to yield better user privacy, they say. And by randomizing the MAC address, you know, this is for those who aren't in the network and don't know this kind of stuff, your MAC address, it's your hardware address of your device. So if you're connected to a Wi-Fi network, it's the hardware address that gets broadcast and, and it's a... Uh, layer two networking uh, technology which is more networking stuff that you probably don't know if you're not into networking but uh, <laughs> we'll leave it at that so the hope with this change is to further enhance user privacy with you know with some network operators advertising tracking mac addresses because you know if you your device always has the same mac address which most of them do uh places can use it to track you and then supposedly, you know, they're able, you know, they can collect information and track your movements, uh, device uses, usage patterns. So, and, and I guess give you advertisement, you know, and stuff like that. Um, now, I don't know on, you know, local networks, how big of an issue being tracked and, and having an advertisement with, you know, at, you know, me, as, as a network admin, you know, administering many networks, I, I kind of don't like this idea. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm sure it, it won't be difficult to turn off. But, you know, as, as a network admin, you know, we kind of like to know what's going on on our networks, who is connecting to it. And seeing random devices and MAC addresses just show up yeah. on your secured network can be a little scary, you know, if you're the type that watches it closely, you know. It's it's so, also it's also gonna mean it's also gonna mean that your device is gonna get a different IP address every time. Um, yeah. Oh, that could really uh, blow up your DHCP leases too. I don't know how often it's gonna randomize, but especially if your network has long leases, mm -hmm. sometimes you do it because yeah. I don't. Know, yeah. it, you could really fill up your lease pool, if, especially if a lot of people are doing this. Yeah. Um. Yeah. There, there. I don't think you've mentioned it. You probably know about this. Um. I can tell you why they want to do this, and it's IPv6. By default, when you get an IPv6 address, your last, uh, I forget how many, but the last X number of bits of your new IPv6 address is your MAC address. And so the idea is, if that follows you around the internet, then that is the, that IP address becomes a universally trackable ID. And that does have some privacy problems. Um, there are different different OSs have different solutions for dealing with that. Um, but I am I am almost certain that what Fedora Forty is doing here is sort of intended to fix that problem. That 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 does make some sense to me. I mean, that's kind of more like a future proofing. I mean, today mostly what I see. I mean, I see most lands are. Most lands are still IPv IPv4, but there are a lot more showing up these days with IPv6. Yep. I guess some of them aren't added, some aren't. Well, the other so, guys, we'll let the other guys jump in if they want to, if they have uh, thoughts about this, or you can continue, Rob. Yeah, I I'm not a networking guy, so keep carry on. I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I mean, like with today's technology, about all I was going to say is that information your mac address it's a layer 2 technology doesn't get out past the router but i guess there can be circumstances and that really depends on how that lan network is managed if those are natted or if they are um bridged it, to the outside yeah ken isn't this more more useful when you're on a cellular network yes and i mean i can 
be. I, I think iPhone's already done this for a while, at least on the mm-hmm. cellular side. I don't actually, I've, I've heard that iPhones did this, but I, I never actually see it in practice on lands for some reason. And maybe I'm just. And Google does it for, on the cellular side, at least. Yeah, so they must do it on the cellular side. So possibly. Um, makes you wonder if this is a move towards supporting mobile devices. I don't. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure this is for privacy when it comes to IPv6. I'm. I can almost guarantee you that that is what this really is about, um, because of that issue where y- you get, you know, the the last half of your. It's less than half, but you know, the last 16 bits or whatever of your IP address mm-hmm. is going to be the same across the internet. Um, almost certainly that's what this is targeted at. Uh, so I don't like I. I don't like IPv6 either. So <laughs> oh, oh. I, I'm hold, like I've said before. Oh. I'm holding out for IPv8. <laughs> oh goodness well let's not go there <laughs> i can't remember an ipv6 address unless it's well, truncated like no, they do you, i guess you're not you're not supposed to you're not supposed to have to that's part of the point of it i remember the ip addresses of all my servers and and and, and most of my uh, client servers i remember those it's well, easy i mean yes you, you <laughs> type them in enough times you not know, to you get it there so there are some other things going on with Fedora 40 that uh, Fedora is just bleeding edge. We're, we're really pushing the envelope and uh, some of it you're going to hate, like maybe the plan to unify user bin and user S bin, uh, which bin and S bin are already sim links to user bin and user S bin. And technically it's supposed to be your user binaries and your system binaries, I think. But when you actually go back and talk to the guys that made these decisions, you know, the guys that actually wrote Unix to start with and ask them, did you make this distinction for this reason? And they will say, no, it's because none of the hard drives we had was big enough to hold all of the binaries. And so we had to split it up like this. Well, in Fedora 40, uh, there is a it's technically for now, it is a change proposal. It is not something that is set in stone yet. Um, but they are looking at doing away with the split between bin and sbin. And now one of them will be a real folder and the other will just be a sim link. Uh, and uh, all of your binaries will be in the same place, which that's going to be a that's going to be a big bucket of binaries. Um, but at the same time, it, it'll be kind of nice. and then. There's one other thing, and we've talked about this a little bit before, and uh, we sort of thought that uh, OpenSUSE was going to be the first to come out with this. And uh, apparently, Intel has had this feature, and OpenSUSE has had this feature now for a while. Um, Fedora, in Fedora 40, and this one looks like it's going to happen, they're going to ship x86, x86, 64, v1, by default. And so we, we've talked a little bit in the past about the, the architecture versions where, you know, if something has, um, oh, I, I forget what all of the details exactly are between V1, V2, V3, and V4. I know with V4, it's like AVX 512 are the extensions. And if your processor has that, it's considered V4. Um, it's 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 those sorts of things, you know, that, that make, your, make your processor faster. It, it has these additional instructions. So, <laughs> you know, something we've seen over the years is like Red Hat with uh, Red Hat 8, I believe it was, um, went to x86-64 v2 only. There was a v3 only. It's been bumped in various places. Well, rather than doing a bump and completely obsoleting all of those old computers, what Fedora is looking at doing is it will have a additional directory where it will download the x86-64 v3 binaries and it'll download x86-64 v4 binaries. And if your processor actually has those capabilities, it inserts those directories into your path so that you automatically grab the, you know, the highest version number that you can of whatever file you're, you're looking at. So for, for a lot of things, this isn't going to make any difference. But for some things, you know, being able to run AVX 512 instructions as part of what you're doing will make a big difference on how fast your processor does things. 
Um, and so this this work kind of came from the Open Sousa guys, but it's here for Fedora. It looks like, um, and uh, I'm I'm pretty excited about this for Fedora 40. And uh, it just it makes me kind of sad because I don't think any of my processors are x86 64 v4 yet. So I'm about to get the processor itch. I think. Uh, I uh, like kinda... the idea of uh, combining SBIN and BIN. I mean, for the average person, like, like kind of like my IPs, I like to know the IPs of my machine. I like to know where my binaries are. I like to know where things are going to be. And, and, and it's not, it's like, not always clear. It's like, is this going to be an SBIN? Is this going to be a BIN? Let's just put them all in one place. I know at one time uh, Canonical was looking at doing something like that as well, but I don't know if they ever actually did anything. So, so the, I know the idea of that's been floating around for quite a while. But mm -hmm. It's good to see yeah. somebody actually making movement on it. Well, Intel, I Clear feel Linux, like I've heard it. Intel Clear Linux does it, and apparently OpenSUSE Tumbleweed has it now. Uh, but Fedora is going to join the party. And, and I feel like that's enough critical mass that all of the rest of the distros will have to to keep up. I feel like uh, Fedora is uh, failing to be the cutting edge on this one. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, yeah, it will be. Oh, and on your, uh, you know, doing the, your second story with the different versions. So I didn't cover it this week, but uh, Pharonix, they tested uh, the canonical version where they, they compiled their server for just V3. Mm -hmm and ran benchmarks and it really depended on what your workload was so if you right. had some floating point there's some graphics workloads tremendous speed up but there's other ones that you know ba basically you have to it's it's one of those look at your workload to see if it's going to make a difference mm -hmm. if it's worth it but yeah some things it really it really makes a difference it doesn't it doesn't particularly hurt performance on any of them right no, you, there's no downside to enabling a higher level. Yeah. A, at worst, it's going to run at the same speed. And, and it's a lot of it, I think, is a lot of the, at least the benchmarks and tests that Michael ran. Some of them don't use those extended uh, instructions. So it just runs the same. Now, how would that uh, impact um, using the Say you get it on a USB stick and you're moving between like a Intel based system and a AMD based system. If you've got your your whole distro on the stick, yeah. So the the way that they're they're planning to do this is through um, what's the term? Um, it's it's uh it's hardware caps, HW caps, and I'm pretty sure that gets determined on boot. And so you know you you boot into a system off your stick. And as it comes up, it's going to look at the processor that's in there and go, okay, these these are the hardware capabilities we have that makes us slot into, you know, V2 or V3 or V4 or what have you. And so it should it should just automatically do the right thing. Um, I I am sure that they would be very interested if you could find an instance where it did not, you know, bug testing for the win. But the way that they're, they've got it planned out, it should actually work the way you would expect it to. Need to get another USB stick and put Ventory on to play with then. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I, I just ordered a USB stick from Timo this week to see how, to see how they work, if they're actually fake or real. <laughs> <laughs> Timo. Oh, they're real fakes. Uh, yeah, they're, they're real fakes. That's, that's, yeah, that's the best we can say about that. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, Jeff, what? Is diagonal monitor mode, and why do we? Why would someone want it? Decoration. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, an actual actual use. So I, I actually have a couple short stories for this segment, and the first is a link in the show notes to an article on Tom's hardware, where Linux is the only operating system to oh. support a twenty-two degree rotation for a display, and you can actually <laughs> customize it to any display rotation you want. Now you might be thinking first off that you know, hey, this is cool. And then the second thought is, why? Why would somebody do this? I, I tell you, well, when I when I pull up when I pull up the picture on Tom'sHardware.com and I see the screenshot of this, that's cool is not what comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, a it's bragging image. rights. 
That that nope, no nobody- sir. No, sir. That image is cursed. <laughs> I'm gonna close that tab because I do not want to look at it anymore. <laughs> I want to run it. <laughs> There's an actual reason for it. So a person going by the handle XSS Fox says the perfect rotation for software design is 22 degrees because it handles longer lines. So she went through and tested zero to 45 degrees, one degree at a time on it. They're guessing it's a 32 by nine aspect ratio monitor. So it's a really, really wide monitor anyway. So she used X Rander, which is the X resize and rotate tool to do this. And the whole thing is, there's some very wide lines that you can show. So it's the whole thing was to get uh, a huge amount of long. You can get a really, really long line without any kind of wrapping, but you know, you're also losing a lot of the outside, the sweet spot. You know, you got a couple inches kind of in the center where you get those long lines and outside of that, you're losing a lot. But I thought it was just kind of neat that Linux is the only one that can do that. So if you say 22 degrees, well, you can't do it on Windows. You're not doing it on Mac. So I I will let the uh, listener decide how actually uh, valuable that is. Uh, So the second one, second link is, you know, with the new year coming up, people say they're always going to exercise, eat better, be more organized and so on. And this is for the people out there going to take control of some of the data in their life. I think almost all of our listeners know what a database is. And if not, it's an organized collection of data or a type of data store based on the use of a database management system. Basically, you're just organizing data. Uh, There's a ton of database programs out there, things like SQL, MySQL, SQLite, just to name a very few of the array of programs out there. Now, most of the programs out there are very powerful, but sometimes they're overkill for what you need. If you're just trying to organize your collection of magazine articles, DVD shows, vinyl records, Warhammer minis, or anything else you got a lot of you want to organize, you know, a simpler solution might be for you. On the other, you know, on on the other OS who shall not be named, there's (laughs) Access. It's the one Rob can't stop talking about. And LibreOffice doesn't let us down. And the link in the show article shows you how to use LibreOffice to make a simple database and set up the fields of information you're going to store. There is a requirement to install Java. And if you have LibreOffice and you don't have a database option, make sure you install the LibreOffice base program. Distributions don't always install that for some reason. I think they're just trying to save a little space or something. So I didn't have it on mine until I installed that. Uh, part of the part of the uh, office suite uh once once you select the you know you you can then go into file new and where you see you know spreadsheet document you're going to have also in there a database uh most likely you're going to be creating a new one otherwise you probably don't need my help and when you do create especially for the first few there's an option to use the table wizard which will step you through the process and it'll step you through creating your fields you want in your database. And after that, it will finish, finish the close out the database for you and then transfer you to a new wizard, which will guide you to a form creation tool. So that's where you enter the data that you selected the fields for in your database. So if you said uh, album and artist, well, this is where you'd have a form that said album and you put the album name in an artist and artist name and everything else. So this is where you're going to be putting in the data to your newly created database. Uh, you put in your data and then you have a nice way to keep track of your data once everything's in there. Now, what you can do with this depends on the data you put in, but say you're keeping track, or, track of a record collection. You know, you're a big vinyl person. Uh, you can easy, use your database to easily find out all the songs written by a specific person in a specific year or maybe what labels a particular artist released on. You know, databases really take off from where simple tables leave off. So when you have too much data for a table, the next step is one of these databases. And for someone wanting to keep track of things and, you know, you need a little more power than a spreadsheet, but, but not a ton. 
that's where this kind of database might be what you're looking for. Now, above this would be your SQLs and other kind of very powerful databases. But I just thought I'd throw that in for any uh, people having a New Year's resolution and involving data. Fun, fun, so, both of them. Yes, Ken. So I wonder if this would uh, allow you to import an old Starbase <laughs> database from Star Office. It might. I don't know. It You can import or you can connect to old other databases, but I don't know the uh, import requirements. Well, so for those that don't know, LibreOffice is a fork of OpenOffice, and OpenOffice is the open source version of Star Office. So there, there is a contingency there. I would not be surprised if it would, if it would still do it, if it'll open the old databases. Which is more than you can say for some of the Windows applications. <laughs> uh, all are, right. Are you going to move your uh, Warhammer collection database there, Ken? <laughs> Actually, it's the video database I need to move. Uh, ah. All right. Speaking of Ken, um, if he's being serious, at least in the back chat, I think he is running out of time. Do you want to cover your last story before you have to take off? I'll be more than happy to. Uh, All right. Basically, uh, for everybody out there in the audience, uh, I found three different articles, uh, one from Pharonix Michael Larabelle, another one by Bobis Borisov, uh, and I can never figure out how to pronounce that, so I'm just going to say Linux IAC. And then, of course, debug points are in them. And this is about the uh, 23rd of December release of Enlightenment version 0.26.0. So I just wanted to talk about this last minute present from Karsten Heitzler. And I apologize if I mispronounced that, Karsten. But according to Bobby Borisov, Enlightenment is Bobby Borisov, Enlightenment is not just a window manager. It's an entire suite offering a graphical shell built on top of the X window system. Mm -hmm. And now more recently, Wayland. Ah. This latest release focuses on enhancing user experience through bug fixes and new functions. One of the highlights is adding a direct display control option to the backlight settings. So if you're using an LED uh, display, that'll definitely help. This will offer more refined control over to the display brightness. The update also introduces larger task previews, enhancing usability and making multitasking more efficient. Now, Enlightenment uh, 0 0.26.0 also adds uh, experimental Wayland mode, which includes a watermark so you know when you are using it. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Arendum, the Enlightenment project also introduces release 1.27 of the Enlightenment Foundation libraries. Uh, the articles, uh, I'll refer to that as EFL. This is a fundamental building block for creating visually appealing, resource-efficient graphical interfaces. Now, this was originally designed for an Enlightenment, but you can find EFL components uh, in consumer electronics and mobile devices, including the Tizen mobile platform, and products from Samsung and Electrolux. I could spend another 10 minutes reading from Enlightenment's <laughs> changelog, or you can uh, follow the links that we have in the show notes and read them yourself. Rob, feel like taking Enlightenment for a spin? You know, I haven't seen Enlightenment in, well, many, many years, but back in the day, uh, it was pretty awesome. Maybe I should give it another shot, huh? Yeah, yeah it's still, still being actively developed. <laughs> It's cool. Now, was Enlightenment one of the tiling desktop managers? I'm I'm trying to remember what its big what its big thing was. I I never actually used it myself. I recall a friend of mine using it, and at the time, really, all I remember is his desktop seemed more flashy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I have a vague memory of like some kind of curtains going. <laughs> the I, I don't i don't i don't even remember beyond that <laughs> more visual frosting more visual frosting there you go uh, <laughs> all right well let's move into our year in stuff 
and uh, we had we had some predictions from last year. So Rob predicted Asahi be ready by November. Well, December month off, not too bad. Uh, Rob, you you were predicting Vision Five was arriving in May. Was that upstream support for it? That was. We were waiting for our Vision 5s to be shipped at that time, ah, or this time right, last right, year. Right. And uh, we expected them like before this time, and they just kept waiting and waiting. So at the time, I said, ah, we're not going to see them till May. Well, if I recall, <laughs> I don't remember. I believe was, we but... got ours near the end of February or sometime in February. I got mine a little before you, I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I think one of y'all did a review, uh, was it in one of the April episodes? That Jonathan. Yeah, that may be. I don't remember for sure when it was. Yeah, Jonathan talked about it, but I believe we got it in February. And um, so they surpassed my um, expectations there. Um, I wasn't I wasn't on there. So I'll call that one uh, uh, not even close. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the Apparently the, the open source... Uh, the, the the process of open sourcing everything and pushing it upstream is going very well actually. So I need to uh, I need to pull it back out. It's somewhere. It's on the desk either here or behind me. I need to pull it back out and give it another shot because uh, lots of stuff, lots of stuff is either accepted or upstreamed already. So yeah, that'd be fun to play with again. Uh, and then the Steam survey. You thought we'd be at two percent by now. I thought we'd be at two percent and. I was so close. If you don't remember this uh, summer here, I want to say September, August, we Linux on the survey was just below 2%. It was so close. <laughs> 1.96? Well, we <laughs> Something like that. Like yeah. that. We didn't I'd quite it make two. it. <laughs> and my wishing for 5% didn't help. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you got to round, you, you round well, at, uh, you round at the, um, the, 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 the five, the, right? So that's 10%, 10% yeah, rounding. Yeah, yeah. It runs so, up uh, so close to two. I, I'm going to call that about as close as you can get. But uh, maybe, I don't know. We, it would, I didn't quite make it. I mean, but I mean Ken, had, back. Ken, Ken went for two very safe, <laughs> very safe predictions that you would see the kernel 6.2 by February or March, which of course we did. And that 5.15 would end of life in October, 2023, which I believe it did. Very and sad. then, and then Ken absolutely shot for the stars and said that we would hit I, 5% on the steam OS survey. I will give Ken half credit on that <laughs> because at the time when we said that, when Ken said 5%, you, Jonathan said, Oh, more than Mac, <laughs> we did <laughs> cross over Mac. That's true. So I would give Ken at least partial credit for that one. Yeah, I said two percent, no more than three percent, and yeah, we beat Mac, but two percent would have beat Mac too. That's <laughs> true. Well, it did. It did. It, it did beat Mac. But but at, at the time, 96. we would have needed something like five percent to beat Mac. Mm-hmm. Now Mac wasn't over two percent. I don't think. I thought wow. it was like three or four at the time. Does they anybody drop that much? Steam Deck or Steam OS support on Chromebooks may have an impact on this year. I mean, it's it's going to be a thing. Uh, I don't know how how big of a deal it's going to be. It's going to depend upon how many gaming capable Chromebooks you see. So that's not necessarily, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think it'll I think it'll be interesting to watch. I want to say I've seen uh, reviews for at least six. I can at least six. It. Well, especially yep. since they've got the uh, what's the term they're using? I want to say Chromebook Plus. Yeah, I, I'm guessing they'll probably even sell maybe up to twenty of them. <laughs> 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 that is terrible. <laughs> that is twenty terrible. different uh, ver- no, 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 twenty. That's not what it means. <laughs> <laughs> goodness raining on the parade man all right uh, jeff you said we would have wayland it would be ready for prime time not in 2023 but sometime in 2024 what do you think about that one i you know i get. i guess it's it maybe half credit i mean it i think on gnome and on amd it's probably there mm-hmm. but kde and nvidia 
not till 24. So I said HDR 2023 was going to be the year of HDR. And in game scope, it was. And we saw the uh, the Steam Deck, the OLED version that ships and has working HDR. Um, but this kind of dovetails into your your Wayland thoughts, because for real broad desktop HDR support, it is uh, it's KD, it's KDE six and uh, Fedora 40 is really going to be the one that pushes it out first. Well, for me. That landed in 2023 because I'm running rawhide on the desktop behind me. I'm super, super bleeding edge. Um, and it's going great. It only crashes, you know, every other day or so. I'm I'm fine with that. I am definitely well, used to the years of Linux crashing that often. <laughs> and in all fairness, in, in that show, you talked about it wasn't going to be ready necessarily for prime time. You talked about you're going to have to load stuff probably. And, you know, there, there's just going to be the you're going to have HDR, but it's not going to be a plug and play. So I would say you got that one. There are stories being released very recently saying 2024 is going to be the year of HDR. So, <laughs> I mean, how can they say the year of H of 2024 is going to be the year of HDR if we've already hit it? You know, Ken, it's it, pretty good. Ken needs to run. I'm going to let him, if he wants to cover any of his predictions for 2024 or anything, I will let him take it. Uh, Plug anything you want to, Ken, and then uh, go go get out of here before you get into any more trouble. <laughs> well, one's kind of going to give away one of yours, but I predict that the second half of 2024 will be exciting as we see even more improvements uh -huh. coming down the pipe. I, I have the other side of that, the other half to that, the other head of the other side of the coin. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but I'm going to go with uh, Linux kernel again, since that's safe to predict. I predict that we'll have uh, reach uh, version 6.11 by the end of October. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be the uh, next uh, LTS. If not, we may end up going to uh, kernel version 7 for LTS next year. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, and uh, I do have some bad news because this is not a prediction. It's a fact. <laughs> We're going to reach end of life for kernel 4.19 LTS and for all the 4Xs by the end of next year. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, and for those of y'all that are listening live, you can go ahead and go to the show notes. I've got a, a Christmas present for all of y'all. It's an alias that I use on an almost regular basis. Uh, you'll see it uh, in the show notes. It's alias dat space gcd equals single quote default equals quote and then the uh oh, i can't think of what do you call that now the curly uh that you can use to uh, as a uh, tilde on the command line tilde tilde that's it been a while since i've actually had to say that. <laughs> but uh that'll let you uh have it default to your home directory then after the uh, ending quote, space, double and signs, mm -hmm. that's to test to see if that actually works. Then space, CD, space, and here we've got a set of quotes again, dollar sign, parentheses, one of my favorite commands, Zenity, space, dash, dash, file selection, space, dash, dash, title, equals, and here in quotes again, we've got select directory. And, and at the, the end quote, we have space dash dash directory, space dash dash file name equals, and then in quotes, dollar sign default, in quotes, in parentheses, and then another in, in quote, followed by a single quote again. Mm -hmm. And when you run that, that'll give you a graphical way to move around your uh, file system to change directories. From the terminal. Oh. Well, there you if, go. If y'all may remember, I actually demonstrated that in one of the early early video episodes. Very cool. All right, sir. Thank you so much for being here. We will see you hopefully next week. Uh, and we will let you get to going.
And I'm going to go ahead and put an, up an avatar while I'm shutting down. So oh, well, I've got have a good one. I've got the three way new year, everybody. I've got the three way ready to go. Happy new year, sir. All right. Uh, let's go to some, I don't know. Let's talk. Oh, here's, here's, here's the question. I'll ask you to this. What did we not see coming? What big news did we not see coming? Was there anything? <laughs> Boy, that's a. <laughs> Hmm. 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 We didn't spend much time thinking about this one, apparently. No, we did not. And no, I, I don't did not. I don't think <laughs> it was a very surprising year. I mean, we got our, our ears so <laughs> tight to what's going on in Linux that we were so close on everything. <laughs> you know, the the Wayland, it's a little early to see if it's going to be 2024, but I think you got it. And HDR, close enough. You know, we've all been so close. You know, we got the the OLED for the Steam Deck. I, that wasn't any of your predictions on here, but I know you said it somewhere. Yeah, we, we, that talked, it'd be we talked about it. We talked about how it was coming. Too many, too much handwriting on the wall to I, miss that one. I know, we had some more. Ad. We had some more turmoil with uh, GNOME, I think, this year, and and changes, and and that's always a thing. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it would be, well, one thing I for me was the AMD mobile chips. Man, they've come out really swinging hard. And I, that kind of caught me off guard. Um, boy, it was, was CentOS this year or was that last year? The, the big shakeup was last year, although... Okay the change to no longer push out um, source code was this year. So there was, there was another shoe that dropped this year. So there was, there was that one. And then, uh, Oh, the one, I guess the one thing is we didn't see the LTS kernel support going away. No, that's true. Or, or cutting, cutting way back from what it was. Yeah, that's true. That one was kind of surprising. All right. right. So what, what are the, that, Go ahead, Rob. When did the Pi 5 come out? Uh, was that, that was this year. year. No, that was this year. Well, pretty recently, actually. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. You're right. That was a surprise. We did not see that one coming. We probably kind of knew eventually there was going to be another one, but I, I I feel like the power of this is maybe surprising to all of us, at least to me. Yeah, that it's, <laughs> that it's twi- twice as powerful, roughly. Two to two and a half times as powerful. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, about the Pi 5, the thing that really... I think people did not expect was the uh, the full blown PCI Express port on it. That's kind of a game changer. True. All right. So let's talk 2024. Um, There are three things that I see coming in 2024. First off, Ubuntu LTS is going to be a big deal. And I know that's kind of weird for me to say. (laughs) This comes from wanting to go and grab things like KDE Neon to play with new stuff in KDE. And the new stuff was broken because KDE or because Neon uses Ubuntu LTS. And Ubuntu LTS is at the end of its life cycle and it's getting to be old and long in the tooth. So, there's a bunch of these projects that are actually going to get a big uplift because they're going to go to a more modern kernel, all kinds of stuff like that. I got to say when I when I saw this in the notes this week, and I, when I first saw that you said Ubuntu LTS is going to be a big deal, and then your third one on there, which you'll get to, I was sure that was Jeff playing <laughs> around, joking around, <laughs> making up things for you, which is why I made a comment in the back channel. Yeah, so no. I was like, ah, that's that's not Jonathan. No, this <laughs> Jeff, was, this, Jeff this is, is messing with this us. This is me. This one is for me. <laughs> no, I I really I really think that the next. Uh, 24.04 is going to be a big deal because so many things are based on Ubuntu and based on that LTS. And it's there's a lot of stuff that have landed since the last LTS. And so it's going to be a big deal for a lot of these projects. Um, speaking of that, the premier Linux desktop for 2024 and maybe for years afterwards is going to be Fedora 40. It is going to be the place to be. It's going to have all the cool toys. Fedora 40 with KDE 6 is going to be the happening Linux desktop. Uh, when I interviewed Neil Gomp, I, I, I 
kind of pulled a cheap shot on him. I said, what is up with this being so good with KDE six on Fedora 40 being so good? Isn't Fedora supposed to be a gnome flagship? (laughs) (laughs) Go, go find, I put it on both Mastodon and Twitter, go find it and retweet it for me, but you can see what he said about that. Uh, yeah, I was surprised. So is the is the mainstream Fedora gonna gonna go KDE too then eventually here? No, pro- no, probably not. Um, Just gotta flip the spins. Yeah, uh, and, and then <sighs> the second half of 2024 is going to be kind of boring. Everything has gotten to the point to where it just works. Like what, what mountain is left to climb? What thing are we going to look forward to? It's like it doesn't work yet, but it's going to like it's. I hate to say this, but it's kind of arrived. Like all of the things that I really wanted to work on my Linux desktop now pretty much work. Um, you know, by the time all of this stabilizes mid 2024, it's it's going to get it's going to get so good. It's boring. Uh, and so those are my predictions for 2024. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Jeff. Jeff, what do you think? <laughs> What's coming in 2024? Well, I, I will disagree with your second half uh-huh. boring. I think you you forgot about uh, transitioning completely to Vulcan, and I think KDE six and everything is going to be big. But I, I bet you we're still working out bugs in October. I mean, I, there will always be bugs to work out, but no, no. Well, I mean, I think major like oh boy, this is still causing issues. And well, for only, you, Jeff, because you're, uh, running you're not running Fedora. <laughs> well i i might have to i'm i was talking on the discord about maybe giving uh the team green test to kde6 Mm -hmm. see how it works get ahead of the full release and see what see what issues i run into but we'll save we'll save that for another time yeah so i've got three predictions here one of them is I think AMD graphics cards are going to take a big leap in performance Mm -hmm. because their current ones are the first gen of the chiplets. And there's going to be a lot of stuff they looked at to say, oh, we could have done this better. We should change this. This." I think this next generation is going to really turn up the heat. Uh, Second is... Probably, uh, before, probably a safe one. Before before you Go move ahead. on, I I want to I want to add an addendum in there. You could actually see the same thing from Intel, if if they decide to go all in on making another GPU, because they kind of took their licks on their first generation, first and second generations of them. So you might see something you might see something impressive come out of Intel too. I I wasn't sure on Intel because <clears throat> they they've got a lot of stuff that they're learn they've learned. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how far along the next generation is in the design, right? Before it came out, you know, did, did were they kind of already boxed into some things that weren't optimum, or were they able to say, "Oh, wait a minute, we're we're going to change things around, make this a lot better"? And I can I can also see Intel taking a big leap forward, but I wasn't yeah. as sure on that one. Yeah, that That's one fair. might not be a might be a twenty twenty five before we see the the leap there. Yeah. Uh. CXL is going to be a lot bigger and it's going to, you're going to see it more in mainstream. I C- think is uh, CXL is the compute express link. Yes. Which yep. is and what it reminds us what that does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's like a PC, kind of like a PCIe standard for various, uh, like memory type interfaces. So you can have like in the server market, you'll have, say one big pool of memory that can be shared across several servers. So you don't need to populate every system with big chunks of memory. You can, you can have a, have it shared across multiple machines. So they grab what they need. Did you do a deep dive on this this year? This is starting yes. to sound familiar now. Yeah. We've talked about it yep. before. Yep. And I, I think we're going to start seeing it more for, and, and, and it, applies to drive storage kind of stuff memory so it's it's kind of a little more universal than just straight memory but i think we're going to start seeing by the towards the end of the year some consumer level things taking advantage of cxl now it's going to be probably high-end desktops it's not going to be you know your standard laptop standard low-end hardware but i think high-end stuff is going to start interfacing more 
I can see it. And I think there's going to be more. Now I'm going out here on a limb, <laughs> but I think there's going to be more acceptance of snap packages, mm -hmm. especially where it's not required to go through canonical and snap does do a few things that, uh, flat packs can't. I could see other distros kind of starting to pick up snap a little bit and maybe even having their own, uh, repositories out there. So are you going to go as far to say that, uh, another distro will have their own repository or what's more, what's, how are we going to, how are we going to prove acceptance of snap? There's always going to be loud people out there. <laughs> I, I will, I will say there's going to be another distribution that will have it. Not count. I'm not counting, you know, the Kubuntu's and Xbuntu's and Linbuntu's and stuff like that. There's going to be another, some, some another uh, non Ubuntu derivative. Maybe flat pack yeah. will get snapped up, huh? <laughs> Quippy. <Ooh. laughs> uh, oh. All right, Rob. What uh, What do you think? What are we What are we looking forward to in twenty twenty four? Well, I try not to play it too safe, but I think I'm going to have some good predictions. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be close. The first one, I, I'm pulling back next year's again, or last year's, not next year's. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to do next year. <laughs> I'm pulling back last year's. I'm keeping. This is the year Linux breaks 2% on the Steam survey. <laughs> so like, close last year. Seems like that's probably a pretty safe guess. I, I, but, you know, it's been, it's, it's dipped back down from that 2%. Who knows if it'll get back up. But uh, we've, and, and we may not have the big things like uh, another Steam Deck to really move that up. But may, maybe the Chromebooks will. Yeah. Um, I think somehow we're well, going to go up. Jeff. Well, it, and that, keep in mind, though, that is based. We don't know the total user count, so we could stay flat where we are, double our Linux gaming size. But because there was so many more people that are on the uh, Windows side, you know, for example, China opens up and they get a lot more people in or sometimes we've, they've had problems with those Internet cafes where because of how they just same completely computer. wipe the machines the same and computer uh, gets counted five times a day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I also wonder if, you know, us here, I'm pretty sure all of us, when we get that Steam survey on Linux, we, we go for our, like, Build yes, out, count me. <laughs> but, but I wonder if, you know, Linux and Linux users, a lot of them being very privacy concerned, if, mm -hmm. if, if there tends to be more people, at least compared to Windows, more people on Linux that, um, uh, it's like, no, I'm not going to share that with you. But there could be people on Windows that are like, I don't want to waste my time with that. Who cares? I, I don't know. It may it may play both ways, but yep. you don't know how they're, they're not 100% accurate. Or maybe statistically it is. I guess I don't know. All right. And so, the OS. Yes. My next, you know, we've been talking about Cosmic now for a few years and, and, and we got to be getting closer. So my next one is that Co a cosmic a beta or something that we can actually install and use will be available by the end of 2024. Any thoughts? Maybe I think coming a snap. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, I think I think that's uh that's probably a a pretty safe bet. I would say at least they're going to have an alpha out, out of uh, of cosmic because you know you you follow their blog posts and it's it's getting to be fairly usable even in in what they're working on so i think within within a year they should have a beta out so and I, here's I another one that. another my, my next one i debated i have and i'm going to re remove this question mark because i'm going to say it um is because I, I don't know how measurable this would be but this is going to be the year of wayland and and how, what i mean by that is any mainstream distros that haven't announced going full wayland this year will and but I, what i mean by mainstream i don't mean those little niche boutiques um that are running cinnamon as their their main or right. uh like linux mint or um i don't know if any of them have xfce but you know the 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 main ones like arch yeah. ubuntu fedora open um am i missing somebody so 
any of those main ones, there's probably one or two I'm missing. I don't know. Any of those main ones, though, will um, announce going full Wayland this year. And final one is someone will announce a premium ARM-based Linux laptop this year. I'm talking... You know, I'm not talking the Pinebook Pro. I'm talking <laughs> premium. Pinebook Pro is great. But when I say <laughs> premium, I mean something that is going to compete with the performance of the M1, M2, M3 Max. Mm-hmm. Something right up there. You know, I, I think I've heard s- similar uh predictions for windows and arm this year i don't know about that that seems like a stretch but linux can do it <laughs> yeah linux can do it no problem um, i'll say instead of premium maybe uh high performance yeah well so this this actually in it inspired me to add one more prediction although i'm leaving the question mark on mine uh you talk about premium ARM-based Linux laptops uh <sighs> i i'm thinking there's going to be a premium ARM-based Linux all in one without the screen uh i think i think we're gonna see the pi 500 i think we'll have a pi 500 for the end of the year uh and i really hope that they put an nvme slot in it that would be amazing it would be a killer machine with the power of the pi 5 and that'd be great (laughs) yep i think i think that would be just great Uh, jeff you added one yes i am (laughs) <laughs> basically i i am also going to throw out there i think by the end of the year we're going to see a real competitive uh i don't know how to phrase this we're going to have an actual contender going against cuda on the graphics cards ah because there's actually a push not just from amd but you know you've got intel involved and then mm-hmm. other companies that want to not get locked in so much and and we uh, yeah we have uh was it rock m but i don't think i think we're going to see a better standard come out maybe it's not ready for prime time but i think we're going to have a a serious path to mm-hmm. uh replacing cuda yeah that that seems reasonable too all right rob couldn't be outdone rob what else do you have what's your yeah, what's so your I- last prediction I'm probably stealing all the predictions for next year. There's not going to be anything left to predict <laughs> except for to reuse them. So I hope I'm not doing that because it's going to make for a real boring prediction show next year. <laughs> um, if I just use the same ones. But I am predicting a new premium Linux phone will be announced by somebody. So are you saying not Android? Not. Yeah. Yeah. When I say Linux phone, okay. I mean not Android. Android is uses i don't know android uses a linux kernel but it's not a i'm talking linux user land <laughs> okay uh we will see not not like the pixel 10 <laughs> <laughs> we will see all right well we'll see what happens we've got some command line tips to cover i think jeff has a new one rob has a favorite jeff go ahead and let's start with you uh, what is your uh, command line tip? Or are these your favorites from the year? Uh, the, these are my favorites for the year. Uh-huh. So I, I put two in here. So the, the first one is B top plus plus. And if you know what the top program is, or there's H top and a top and various tops. I, my favorite is B top plus plus. Now it's just going to be B top when you use it, but it really does. It's kind of like, all the other variants put together, it gives me everything I need. So I don't, I kind of quit using H top and a top and other versions. B top now is my go-to program. And I, it's my favorite top program and it's customizable and you can do a bunch of stuff with it. Um, the other one I have is G overlay, which is a GUI for mango HUD and other graphical overlays. So, this is like whenever you see, you know, uh, Linus Tech Tips, Jay's Two Cents, you know, Gamers Nexus, and they're showing a, a game running mm-hmm. and you see, you know, CPU frequencies and frames and temperatures and things like that. Well, this controls those. So programs like Mango HUD, which are not graphical 
and a little harder to use, it makes it a lot simpler. So whenever you're playing games and you're benchmarking or you're trying to figure out optimum settings or whatnot, it's makes the, it makes life easier. So th- those are my two favorites for the year. All right. Very good. Rob, you've got a favorite? I do have a favorite, and this is a recent one that uh, you did, fine. but I just love it. Uh, your <laughs> excise tip for those who is what? Probably our last show <laughs> that yeah, we probably. did. Or, or you, maybe either, the one before. The last one or the one right before it, yeah. But your <laughs> excise tip on how to know that um, uh, an app is using or what was that for? An app is using Wayland. Whether it's whether no. it's Wayland or X Wayland, yeah. Whether it's Wayland or X Wayland, there we go. Yep. Because yep. if it's X Wayland, your X, the X size, the googly eyes will track the cursor even when the cursor is over the app. But if it's native Wayland, the the X size will not continue to track. <laughs> right. Yeah. So and and the reason why I like this, and you know, I'm 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 maybe gonna feel embarrassed about this a little bit uh sharing this but maybe you guys know this already about me i i have a problem with arguing with people on the internet (laughs) i do i I have a problem and i can't help myself i try i'm I'm a lot better than i used to be but when people are wrong on the internet i gotta tell so (laughs) that xkcd comic was written about you it was i was so 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 there was somebody on there we're arguing about Wayland being ready or not. And he tried to say, you know, I told him how, like, you know, how is this app? You know, apps aren't ready for Wayland. And, you know, I kind of said Wayland is running and then X Wayland is used as a shim to get those apps to work on Wayland. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, it's the other way around. You got that backwards. And he, X Wayland <laughs> is the display manager, and 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 I don't even know where he was going with this. And then I kind of use the uh, the X eyes example as how <laughs> to see how that works, and and along with other information. But I use that, and and then because I try not to argue with people, I really try. <laughs> I left the <laughs> chat or I left the, uh, the, the, I left and be, be the, be the bigger man. Good job. <laughs> I, I said my piece and I was out. <laughs> oh, all right. So I've got a favorite, you know, I don't know if this is actually from this year though. NCDU. I, this may have been from before 2023. This may have been a 2022 tip, but I use NCDU all the time to figure out, what is eating all of my hard drive space? <laughs> I use NCDU quite a bit, um, but I've got a new one for you too. So with all the HDR fanciness, uh, the MPV, <coughs> the MPV video player will play Wayland or will play um, native HDR output. If you've got all the other things there, it'll do it. But the uh, command to do so is kind of a mouthful. It's enable HDR WSI equals one Wayland dash dash VO equals GPU next target target color space hint GPU GPU API equals Vulcan GPU context equals Wayland VK. It's like, good night. You don't want to. So in honor of Ken, I've got an alias HDR play HDR play all of that. So it's just HDR play and then the name of the video you want to play. And, uh, I've been enjoying that quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. So there you go. All right, uh, guys. For the record. It, yeah. N- NCDU was first done on December 27th, 2021 by me. 2021. Oh, well, best. Of the I decade. think, I think you did a main story on it though. At one time. I may have, I don't know. It's good. <laughs> We talked. We talked about it a lot. It's a great command. It's a, it's a really nifty little command. It's almost twenty twenty four, and we've been doing this since twenty twenty one. Apparently, yeah. I think I think we're almost on our third year in a few months here. Oh, on our three years, yeah. <clears throat> yep. On on our spreadsheet, the first one I have, which is not, <clears throat> excuse me, the first show, May eighth, twenty twenty one. Getting close to. Uh, that anniversary i mean this is this is going to be show 132 goodness 
And I, right. I first, I first showed up on show number six. <laughs> and then Jonathan and I were both there for show zero. Show zero. Uh, That's why we're wearing yeah, the suits, and, then, and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and I think show. Well, the first, and I, I don't have zero or one in the in the on the sheet, but show eleven looks like all of us were here. So we finally got the band okay. together. <laughs> we got the band together on show 11, uh, took, uh, July 31st, 2021. Fun times. All right. Well, let's wrap this one up. Goodness, we've been at it for an hour and a half, just about. Uh, Rob, let's go to you first. If you've got any closing words or final thoughts for you, peace sure. out. Sure. <laughs> I have a couple. I'm not muted, am I? No. no you're good. <laughs> so one, uh, I saw that Guadec 2024 is going to be in Denver this year. It's going to be real close to... Uh, to uh, you, Jonathan, kind of, kind of, uh, kind of, not too far from me either. Uh, even though we're not GNOME users, maybe you should go. Um, though I'm not sure it might be right when uh, one of my summer vacations are planned. So, otherwise, I if if it's not, I'm considering strongly going to that. Um, otherwise. All I have is kind of my normal stuff. A little, I've updated my website, put some new information on there, robertpcampbell.com over here. Um, and I've added a link um, since uh, I do this voluntarily. Pro bono. Pro bono. So does Jeff and Ken. And Jonathan doesn't get much, so he says. Yep. Um, but it is pro bono. So if you want, you want to help uh, support. You don't have to. I'm not struggling or anything. But if you want to help uh, support, show your love, I do have a uh, buy me a coffee link right here. So you can uh, go here and buy me a coffee or three or five or ten or whatever you want. <laughs> That's buymeacoffee.com slash Robert P. Campbell. It is. <laughs> All right. Or just find the link. The Very cool. Okay. And Jeff. Wow, I've just been out outmatched for the show. You know, I had the same background and no no suit and tie, but and no uh <laughs> no donation things. But uh I will leave with a poem that just seemed well, it's it's a uh, haiku, but it seemed appropriate for the end of the year where everybody's kind of reinventing themselves. So here we go. Chaos reigns within, reflect, repent, and reboot. Order shall return. Have a great week and have a great year, everybody. <laughs> uh, that's great. Okay. Thank you guys for being here. It's been fun. It's been a fun year. Uh, so if you want to keep up with me, of course, the other place to follow me is Hackaday, hackaday.com. There is the security column goes live every Friday morning. And then now we have hackaday.com slash floss. Make sure and check that out to get your Floss Weekly fix for the week. Uh, and other than that, I just want to say thank you so much to our live audience. We've had quite a few folks in chatting with us live. And uh, as well, thank you to everyone that downloads. Make sure to spread the good word and uh, let folks know about it. And we will see you all next week, next year, here on the Untitled Linux Show. <laughs> <laughs>